During the last 12 months, New Zealand's significantly lifted its ability to respond to COVID-19. For example, we've improved our testing and contact tracing capability. Uh, that means that since the August uh, resurgence in Auckland, we've successfully responded to at least four other outbreaks without having to move up alert levels. Other key things to highlight are the fact that uh, we now, we've processed uh, in, the, in the last three months uh, more than 470,000 tests. So that's an average of more than 36,000 tests per week, which is a significant advance on where we have uh, been before, and it puts us amongst the highest countries in the world on a per capita basis for, for testing for COVID-19. We've seen significant increases in our contact tracing capability across our public health units, uh, supported by district health boards. Uh, they now have the capacity to manage 350 low complexity cases per day uh, and surge capacity to extend that to 500. The National Contact Tracing Solution has become fully operational and it's providing that support to the public health units. We've got very strong border orders governing our air and maritime borders and our managed isolation facilities, uh, which are of course our front line of defence against COVID-19. We have mandatory testing of all border staff in place, those staff who are working in risky areas of the border where they could come into contact with the virus. And we've also been effectively balancing public health risk whilst managing economic impact. For example, finding ways to bring international sport uh, back to New Zealand whilst keeping COVID-19 out of our community. Uh, we know that the virus continues to rage offshore, and despite our best efforts, there is always the potential uh, for it to make its way across the border. So our summer planning approach to manage any, any uh, cases over the uh, holiday period supports our overall elimination strategy for COVID-19. We'll find it, we'll stamp it out, uh, and we've made sure the government COVID-19 and the uh, team and the national support network are ready. Although we can't predict exactly where or how a community case might emerge, New Zealanders can be reassured that planning has been extensive. Uh, and that's included scenario testing and understanding actions that might be needed, including as a last resort, any changes to alert levels. The Director General will have further comments around the health advice around when that might happen. More generally though, I want to reassure the public that we'll continue to respond swiftly and openly to any issues that emerge around COVID-19 during the summer holiday period. If a positive case was found in the community, we'd use the usual approach to communicating with the public. Updates and advice would, in the first instance, be provided by me and the Director General or someone acting on behalf of the Director General. Uh, it's important to remember, though, that that's worst case scenario and we're doing everything we can to ensure that everybody can enjoy their summer holiday period. After a long, hard year, New Zealanders do deserve to have their summer holiday, including those who are working hard uh, at our borders. We need to make sure that we take the pressure off them too. So let's thank each and every one of them by doing our bit uh, to stop the spread of COVID-19. So again, uh, as part of our Make Summer Unstoppable campaign, I'll remind you of our key messages. We should all be washing and sanitising our hands, scanning QR codes, turning Bluetooth on and using the COVID Tracer app, staying home when we are feeling unwell and seeking advice around testing if we do start to show any symptoms. And if we're going on a way, away on a break, please do think about what you might do should something happen and you be required to stay where you are for a period longer. So do you have a backup plan for your homes and your pets in the event that you, for any reason your return home may be delayed? Uh, it'll be the continued commitment of our team of five million, combined with the planning that we're outlining today, uh, which gives us all the best chance of enjoying that fantastic Kiwi summer that we are all looking forward to, particularly those of us in Wellington who are still waiting for it. So I'll now invite the Director General to speak to you. Thank you, Minister. Kia ora koutou katoa. So we are coming to the end of a year that has felt longer than most, and I know Kiwis are looking forward to a well-earned break. We certainly are at the Ministry of Health. However, this will be our first summer with COVID-19 in our lives, and we need to be prepared for that. There's no doubt we have done well as a country this year, and to use a cricketing analogy, we do not want to drop a catch now. We know Kiwis uh, will be travelling in large numbers outside of the main centres as they travel to lakes, beaches 
and campsites across the Motu. And also camper vans, I understand, by camper van. People will also be attending events and festivals where the risk of transmitting infections, including COVID-19, is higher. It's important to remember that the reason we can safely attend such events is because we have been so vigilant to date. We know everyone will be keen to take time to relax and enjoy themselves. This does run the risk of letting us, us letting our guard down and let's not take that risk. We have undertaken across government extensive resurgence planning for three broad scenarios that could eventuate over the summer months. The first scenario involves a border worker testing positive as part of routine testing. In this situation, we would simply invoke our current test, trace and isolate response that has served us so well over recent months. The second scenario we have been rehearsing involves a member of the public testing positive, perhaps when they're on holiday at a campsite somewhere, a camping ground, but this person has a connection to the border somehow. This again would involve our test, trace and isolate approach, but it might also include some ramped up local testing, some targeted restrictions on movement and potentially regional alert level changes may be required. The third and potentially most serious scenario that we have rehearsed involves a person testing positive after returning home, having attended a major event in a different region. Now this scenario could lead to a nationwide increase in the alert level, uh, testing and tracing being significantly ramped up uh, around a number of regions and other events cancelled and potentially people being asked to stay in place in their bubbles. In each of these scenarios, and in the second and third in particular, there are extensive contingency plans in place both across the health system and wider government. As I said earlier, let's not take the risk of those broader scenarios. What everyone at home needs to know firstly is how to do your bit to prevent that outbreak, and the Minister has rehearsed the uh, actions that we want all New Zealanders to continue to do. And what I'd just like to remind people of are the symptoms you should be looking out for. Uh, if you develop symptoms of a runny nose, a sore throat, cough, fever, and in particular, a loss of the sense of smell or taste, then please do seek advice. Healthline is the place to go, and they will be able to tell you where you can get a test. If there is an outbreak where you are, of course, there will be, as the Minister said, uh, information being provided. We will inform everybody, and it, the uh, advice is to stay in place where you are until uh, we, we provide further advice about what to do. It's very important in the first instance people don't rush to get home and potentially take the virus with them. The health sector itself is well prepared using the lessons we have learnt from earlier cases and the regional lockdowns to inform our planning and preparations. We do know what to do. Our DHBs all have summer preparedness plans in place. We have worked uh, in the Ministry with our public health units to understand and prepare for the potential isolation and quarantine of cases and close contacts while people are away from home and contact tracing for people who may have been at events or mass gatherings. We've also worked with event organisers to implement systems to support contact tracing should this be required such as ensuring QR codes are available and being used at entrances and capturing the details of attendances electronically where possible through the information in ticket sales. Of course, that then requires everyone in terms of the QR code availability to actually scan in using the codes. Please do so. Our core systems of testing, tracing and isolating are well established and we know they work. We also know that we can scale up quickly if needed and we have trained people and other resources on standby. Our border controls, as the Minister mentioned, are strong and our health system is prepared to respond to any cases of COVID-19 that emerge, but as we've said before, this is a tricky virus and we all need to keep our eye on the ball to ensure our summer break can be enjoyed without restrictions. We are in an incredibly privileged position. While we have planned for a possible resurgence, let's stop it happening in the first place. Prevention is, as they say, better than cure. So I'm asking all New Zealanders to do their bit to make summer unstoppable. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Happy to open up for questions. How worried are you about an outbreak during summer, considering people are moving around the country and there are big events like festivals? Well, I'm not worried about an outbreak happening because I think our systems at the border are very tight. 
However, in these situations, you plan for the worst and do everything to ensure that, in fact, we don't uh, get into that situation. Uh, I'm, I am confident in the planning that has happened across government and across the health system, and I am confident in our, uh, our tracing and contact, uh, contact follow-up and our isolation systems. We've shown those can work, and uh, we won't be taking any chances. What the, the key thing, though, is, is detecting any cases in the first place, and that's why it's very important that we maintain our testing uh, volumes over summer and that if people do have symptoms, they do get a test. No, I agree. What I'll again, let you follow up with them, Mikey. Just, just follow up here. Uh, depending on, um, sorry, just going back to scenario three, if there is a case, say, at a music festival and you have to keep people in place, what does that contingency plan look like in terms of holding people in that spot and, and how long could they be there for? So the situation here was uh, that the scenario we have been tested, that someone actually tests positive uh, once they've gone home from a festival. And that's the more likely thing that would happen because an infection would be more likely to happen at the festival detected once they get home. Clearly in that sort of situation where we have New Zealanders dispersed right around the motu, that requires a national response. And so if there is an alert level change required, and that would be on uh, a decision for Cabinet to make on our advice, then that would be, uh, require a national alert level change. Is there a likelihood that, say, if people are at a holiday destination, they'd have to stay put for a, a lockdown period then? Or would you facilitate people being able to move home? And I think what we've said is it's going to depend on the circumstances, but the people need to have plans in the event that their return home is delayed. Uh, there could be a variety of reasons why it could be delayed, and it might only be a short delay, um, depending on the circumstances of what we were dealing with. If we were dealing with something, for example, that was localised within a campground, then we may say we want everyone to stay in that campground until we've got a, a handle on it. So those are the sorts of things where we just have to make sure that people have thought through all of the different scenarios in their own planning. Could that though with the campground, if, if for example a family is there, will you be looking at you know accommodation support for for example because you know for some families things are tight at the moment. If they're asked to stay there for an extra week or so, that could push their budgets. Will you be looking at that? Uh, look, I mean those are all things that we would deal with on a case by case basis. It's difficult to kind of predict every possible scenario. I think what the director general has done is outlined three broad scenarios uh, that we've used to make sure that our systems are ready to go. But of course, those will be customised uh, depending on what, what situation may arise. So should families then be looking at budgeting potentially for staying somewhere longer? Should they be putting that into their plan, planning at the moment for summer? Look, I think people should, should just be thinking about what would they do in the event that they couldn't get home by the date that they had planned to get home. Mm -hmm. Obviously, again, I want to reiterate, these are all worst-case scenario plans, and we're all doing what we can to ensure that none of this ever eventuates. But it's always useful for people to have in the back of their minds, what would I do if something unexpected happened while I was away on holiday? You said you've been working on this for a while, and you've been running for lack of a better word, war games to see how this plays out. How long exactly has the government been planning for this summer? Uh, well, I mean, I think what you've seen over the course of the last year is as our knowledge of COVID-19 continues to grow and as our uh, understanding of the different types of situations um, that we might face has continued to grow, we've continued to map out different scenarios. Before our August uh, outbreak, we were looking at, at doing some 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 you know, some simulations, if you like, to test our contact tracing systems. In the end, uh, the August outbreak um, tested our systems pretty thoroughly. Um, but we have always been looking at how do we make sure that we've got as many scenarios mapped out as we can, that we've really got an understanding of what we would do in different circumstances. Bearing in mind, though, that it, you, can, you can never predict with great certainty what might have happened before the August outbreak. I don't think any of us would have predicted that that's quite what we would end up dealing with. Um, so we had to adapt. Usually, the, usually the message of a summer for Kiwis is slip, slop, slap. What would the ministry's message to New Zealanders be this summer with the COVID threat? And scan. <laughs> slip, slop, slap, and scan. If that scenario does happen and uh, New Zealand was put back into lockdown, how would officials manage potentially hundreds of thousands of people travelling home <coughs> to, to be at home lockdown? Can I just comment yeah. there, uh, Minister? So, uh, you know, we're in the situation at this time of year, different from back in March, where actually our borders, we know, are incredibly tight. And we know that if there is a case coming into New Zealand, it will be somewhere through the border, either through an air crew or through a border worker becoming infected. We have had a number of these in recent months, and we have dealt with them all very quickly and managed to um, contain them. 
that's the situation that is most likely to happen. Uh, if there is, of course, a, a broader um, community uh, outbreak, we would deal with that as we, uh, as we faced it, and that may include regional measures or it may include national measures, depending on the nature of where that infection had occurred. I dare say, though, that I know, you know that people have to adapt their holiday plans every year. We know um, if anyone like me has camped on the Coromandel uh, around Christmas any year, um, I've been evacuated from a campground in the middle of the night because of flooding, uh, summer flooding. Uh, likewise, the car can sometimes break down, sometimes things don't go to plan. Just make sure you know who can feed the cat or the dog and just what, what else you might need to do and especially if you're in a remote location that you may just take some extra supplies and try and keep in contact with the news just on a regular basis. So I'll I'll if, a level, if, if a national response is required, have officials, have you mapped out how hundreds of thousands of Kiwis could, have, could travel home? if we all went back into yeah, lockdown. The same way that they would have travelled home anyway. If that was the situation that was arising, we would be giving that very careful consideration, but almost certainly we would be asking people to go back to their home base before we went up alert levels. Yeah. Consider so, so calling off or perhaps scaling back festivals given the level of risk associated with them? No, because the risk is ultimately quite low of anything happening in the first place. And so these are just precautionary things. I think if everyone is, is, is vigilant and, and just continues to take precautionary measures, I think we can all... Uh, we can relax over the summer uh, because we're in a very good position as a country. So the, the things that we're talking about really are precautionary, um, but the risk profile wouldn't suggest that we needed to, to cancel the events. Case okay, scenario though, isn't it? In, in, in terms of the scanning in at the entrances of these festivals, is that mandatory or optional? Um, though the organisers of the festival need to know that um, need to make sure that we've got a way of getting in touch with people if we need to. Now, QR codes obviously are very helpful. Ticketed events are easier than unticketed events because in a ticketed event you'll have you know you'll be able to go back through the ticket information to find people. Um, but yes, we do want uh, event organisers to be encouraging people to use QR code scanning, um, to be encouraging people to turn on the Bluetooth functionality on their phones. Bearing in mind that at big festivals, for example, a QR code is only going to tell you that you were there. It's not necessarily going to tell you who you came into contact with and that's where the Bluetooth could potentially be quite helpful. The no, scenario that you can trace everyone that goes to a music festival because if you can't trace everyone then does that not bring up problems later on? So how confident are you that you will be able to trace everyone that goes to a festival? Might ask the Director General to comment on that. Well, I think the the, uh, the Minister's pointed out that the technology is helpful in this regard, so the QR codes and uh, the Bluetooth technology, but also the ticketing. Now, of course, someone some people on sale or give their tickets away. The key, the key uh, thing that has worked well for us, though, is our public communications, is reaching people through, uh, through the um, media as well as through social media and uh, word of mouth. So, I mean, we're confident that people would get the message and that uh, anything we, that we're requiring people to do, that they would do it. And that includes if we're asking people to go and be tested. I should say that before we had the Auckland August outbreak, break, as the Minister's uh, alluded to, we were planning for a number of scenarios, and our worst case scenario that we were about to tabletop exercise was an outbreak in South Auckland. Mm -hmm. We had a real life example, and we were able to, through appropriate use of alert levels and through contact tracing and follow up and isolation, to get around that outbreak. And if necessary, we would do that again. We'll come over so, here. So, the Doctor, Director General has confirmed that if, in this worst case, large scale outbreak, which we agree is not likely to happen, Kiwis will be asked to go back home. So, will they be given a certain of time to do that? Look, it would depend on the circumstances. I think my main message here is if should anything happen, this will happen. And so we will then communicate exactly what we want, what we need people to do at the time based on the, the circumstances. So people just keep an ear out um, when they're on holiday and we'll let them know if anything changes. And just on the Trans-Tasman bubble, it only took an hour yesterday for the Australian Government through Health Minister Greg Hunt to come out and he said, quote, we are ready to implement from our side as soon as New Zealand is ready. Were you heartened by that message and can it speed up the implementation of the bubble knowing that Australia is red hot keen to go now? Yeah, look, we're working very um, hard and very fast to make sure we can get that bubble open as soon as we can with Australia and also with the Cook Islands where we've been um, also doing some work. I was at Auckland Airport this morning um, going over with them their plans to separate the airport into two areas, so the, the health supervised zone, if you like, for people who are coming from non-safe zone countries um, and the safe zone. And so I wanted to step through that very carefully 
quickly because obviously that's a key area for risk for us. We've got to make sure that we've got complete separation um, between anyone who's travelling in the safe zone uh, and anyone who's travelling outside of the safe zone. And so I was spent several hours um, with Dr Viral accompanied me for that, just asking lots of questions and just going through that carefully. We're also talking to the airlines um, because the airlines, um, as you'd imagine, they have their fleets grounded um, and they have to bring their capability back up in order to be able to service something like the Trans-Tasman. Um, and so we're, we're talking to them about how soon they could operationalise that. Uh, and then, of course, we've still been working through those final um, details so that when we do open up, we can tell people what would happen uh, in the event of an outbreak, whether it was in New Zealand or in Australia. We have to be able to answer that with a degree of confidence um, because people will need to know that when they're making their plans. For example, if they ended up having to stay, say they were going to the Gold Coast and they ended up having to stay longer in the Gold Coast because there was, because there was an outbreak there and there was no way for them to come home, they would need to know that. So those are all the things that we're working through so we can give certainty at the point that we hit the go button. Um, but we're working very quickly um, to try and make sure we've got those answers as fast as we can. Is it Cabinet that presses that go button or, or is it devolved? now that you've had that discussion at Cabinet. Can you talk us through how that decision will be made? Uh, no, it will be a Cabinet discussion in the first instance, um, although it's likely that there will be we will reach a point where the finer kind of details uh, end up having to be ironed out by Ministers, um, and, and probably also with the Director-General and, and his team providing final advice, um, but we're not quite at that point yet. I think it was Dr Bloomfield, you talked about... Um, resources are on standby. What do you sort of mean by that? Is, is it something like response teams on standby to travel to certain areas? And if that is, you know, what does that look like? How does that work? Yeah, that's correct. One of the advantages of the national contact tracing solution is that we can delegate work from any region in the country to other regions. And so the on-call teams in every public health unit will be able to take work wherever they are. That is, uh, case and contact follow-up work can be delegated out. But we also have people from both the public health units and also from our team in the ministry who can deploy out to support a public health unit in particular if there is a if they need support if there's an outbreak in their in their region. So that's part of our planning and those people are all on standby. Okay, we'll come to that. Are you concerned yeah. about um, a big drop off in testing over summer as if people are away? And are there any plans for surveillance testing if, if that if it does be the case? So uh, it, it it's possible that um, that testing will drop off. Uh, and, and there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, over summer and people are outside a lot, there's less respiratory illness around. So that will, will uh, um, reflect less people with symptoms. Our most important surveillance testing is the really thorough testing that is mandated and is now in place around the border. And so air crews, maritime and airports. Uh, so ports and airports, that will continue exactly as it has right through. So that will keep the testing volumes at a certain uh, level. Other than that, the important thing is for people, if they are symptomatic, get a test and they can find out from Healthline where the closest place to where they are is they can get a test. Do you stress, yeah. the, do you stress the importance before, though, of, of getting tested in order to detect an outbreak over summer, but getting tested if you're sick isn't part of the government's ad campaign over summer? Why is that? And... How, I guess, will you be encouraging New Zealanders over summer to be tested if we, they are sick? You didn't read the fine print. In the uh, stay home if you're unwell, it also says then seek medical advice um, as to whether or not you should get a test as part of that too. So um, we're saying to people, look, if, if you're not showing symptoms... Um, then you know we don't want everybody rushing down to get tests all of the time. Um, but actually, if there's reason for people to get a test, then Healthline is the first port of call. There, give Healthline a call; they'll tell you whether you should get a test and where you could go, where you should go to get that test. Yes. Come over here. Runners will need to have some way of contact tracing attendees. Is that under a Section 11 order that they'll be required to do that, or is it not a requirement? It's just a strong encouragement. Uh, no, I think from memory, um, there is a there is a requirement in there. There's a requirement for them yeah. to have the QR codes, yeah. and they will be one of the advantages is that people attending entering events go past the security uh, place and where they have to present their ticket, and they can be uh, encouraged to uh, scan the QR code, and that's the conversation that's been had with all event organisers. Yeah. Well, leave, 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 you that mentioned one. last week that you would take to cabinet this week or that you were discussing cabinet this week, any possible widening of that mask mandate for public transport to other cities? Is that, um, did that happen yesterday? And, and, and can we expect an announcement on that? No, we'll, be, we'll be discussing that at uh, Cabinet Business Committee tomorrow, so should have an answer for you that, on that by, by the end of the week.
Just on the fine print of the, the sort of the campground scenario, or you know, the, so say you're a camper and you're you're at a campground in partial reception in the Coromandel, and you get an alert saying that an outbreak's happened in your campground or nearby. What actually happens? What do you see? I think probably the first thing that's likely to happen in a scenario like that is the public health units will be on site very quickly should that happen, uh, and you'd be getting advice uh, there on site. Um, telling you what you should be doing. So if it was if it was something very localised like that, but again, I'll ask the Director General yes, to so, comment. So the alert's much more uh, helpful in a situation, for example, where someone's been in a restaurant or a bar or out shopping and they don't know the other people or it's not easy to identify other people who might have been in that venue at the same time. In the, in the situation of a campground or an event, uh, it's, it's much easier to identify, of course, the people who are there or who have been there. And as the Minister said, that's when there would be a local on-the-ground response would be the first thing. Out to wherever, you know, out in the sticks and be testing people at the campground, telling them they can't leave until until you're sure that no one else has the virus. Is that? It's very situation dependent, but the public health units are now, you know, we've had a year of doing this and a large number of our public health units have had experience in doing this when, when they have had cases in the community earlier in the year. Thresholds, like, you know, oh, if there's five cases uh, obtained in this area, we'll, we'll do a regional, uh, like a localised lockdown or any sort of any sort of measurement in your mind? Uh, not on not number of cases. One case isn't is enough to trigger um, a big response, and then it's once we've gathered information from further testing, isolating, contact tracing, then we would make a decision about anything around uh, alert level changes, and that would be advice to cabinet who would make the decisions. Okay, there. we'll do uh, we'll do one more sweep of the room, going starting on this side and moving our way across. So, yeah, go on then. Thank you. Um, how many people um, had entered New Zealand since the lockdown that haven't had to go through hotel quarantine? Was there a certain class of people that haven't had to? No, um, every, everybody, sorry, since the... Since the border closed. Since the border closed back in, towards the beginning of the year. Um, no, everybody who's come through has had to do that, unless they are a part of an exemption. Uh, so unless they get an exemption. Uh, very, very few exemptions to that have been granted. And... Uh, a couple oh, the, of oh, the Director General is the one that grants them, so I, think, I don't think uh, it's very I've many. I've delegated that to MB. Well, yeah. I don't have the number, but we could yeah. get the latest number from, from yeah. MB, and those are on medical or compassionate grounds usually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, diplomat, diplomats, are, uh, yes, they're encouraged to uh, self-isolate. They don't have to, but they can uh, use managed isolation. Yeah. Um, just on numbers, do you have the COVID numbers for today? And I think what's well, been maybe like a month since we had the last community case. Does that make you feel enough safer heading into some? Uh, yes, indeed. The fact that we haven't had a community case for some time and that we, we are getting the cases in managed isolation and given the scale of this outbreak abroad uh, in countries where people are travelling to New Zealand from, um, actually I'm surprised we're only getting the small numbers that we are in managed isolation. That may continue to increase, but the, the uh, situation in our facilities is exactly the same. Everyone is considered to have COVID until proven otherwise. Any numbers for today, Jeff? We have, we have one new, new, new case, case in uh, managed isolation today. Absence payments, why was that necessary and how is the resurgence support payment different to the wage subsidy scheme? Um, so, I mean, uh, the Minister of Finance has announced today some additional economic measures uh, that are available to support people uh, in the event that we end up having to escalate alert levels over the summer period or, in, indeed, in the first part of next year. Probably the one bit that I can comment on um, is the fact that there is now a payment available uh, to businesses whose staff need to isolate because they are awaiting a test result. Uh, it's a $350 payment, the upfront payment, uh, non-refundable, so basically they, they'll get that money while their staff are having to, to support them to ensure their staff can isolate. And that's because we do acknowledge that, um, you know, if a business um, ended up with, with several staff having to be tested and having to isolate, that's a significant impost on that business, and we, um, if it's particularly for a small business. So we want to be able to support them there. We don't want the financial cost to be an impediment to people doing what we're asking them to do, which is to isolate while they're waiting for a test. Is supposed to be passed through to the to the worker? Or no, is it for no, but they should obviously be paid um, for the time that they're isolating. So if they're on sick, if they were if they would be working during that period, for example, um, then they should be paid as if they were working during that period. Ask what um, conversations you've had with airlines around their capacity of moving 
a large volume of New Zealanders, especially if they're spread out. And are you confident they have the capacity to do that if there is a change of alert levels and people need to go home? I think like the Director General said, uh, people would need to be... Um, um, returning home, in the event that that was what was required, returning home as they would have normally planned to do, but the timing might have been a little bit different. And uh, we know from our last experience with this year, New Zealand in particular worked very, very hard uh, to make sure they helped to accommodate uh, people's needs to travel. And um, I'm sure that there would be goodwill there from them to, to help us to do that if we needed to do it. And if the public health units, and if there was a, an outbreak or a couple of cases that popped up in a small remote holiday town, how quickly could public health units mobilise and get there and start testing people? Well, the public health units have people working every day through the break and, uh, and others on call if required. So they would be able to be there, of course, same day. Uh, and then we're uh, our resurgence sort of support, our team that might go in and help, the aim is to have them there to support if required within 24 to 48 hours. That's uh, in addition to the ability for that work to be transferred around the country really right from day one. So if there was a small outbreak at a campsite or a music mm. festival, for example, people could realistically expect to stay there for a couple of extra days while everyone's tested and the test results come back. Well, it depends. It very much depends on the situation, but that may well be the case. And as I, as I said earlier on, uh, uh, weather events and other events happen every year, and people are, are really good. I know at adapting, and I know that they will be supportive of whatever effort. This is nothing more or less than we've done um, before summer, right through the last few months. Uh, people have been incredibly supportive and helpful. And when asked, they have isolated. They have waited for tests, and then, uh, depending on the results of those tests. Last done what's been asked. Last question. Are you convinced you've got a clear and coherent plan here? Because it's a little bit confusing to sort of ascertain what will happen in these various scenarios you're proposing. Well, I mean, I think that the key message is that, you know, it's, it's impossible to map out every individual scenario um, that, that could potentially happen over the summer. What we've done is we've taken a variety of different scenarios. Um, we've run our systems, you know, run them through our systems to make sure that we're prepared. Um, but we will have to adapt in a, as we need to, depending on the, the reality of whatever might come up during that period of time. So it's a bit of a wait and see. Well, I think everything to do with COVID-19 when we're not dealing with cases is a, is, a, is a wait and see, but take lots of sensible precautions, um, which is pr probably, or I think you want to... As you to say, it's prepare yeah. and see, not wait and see. All right, that brings us to the end for today. This is, I hope, the last time we'll be standing here this year. Mm -hmm. So can I wish you all a good summer break? I'll be speaking to some of you later in the week in a different context, but uh, can I thank all of you for helping us to convey our messages out to the New Zealand public uh, over the last um, year and, uh, and wish you and everybody who's watching a very enjoyable summer break. Thank you.